So today we're solving a new and uh, quote-unquote unsolvable type of equations. Um, yeah, we make child's play out of unsolvable things. That's what's beautiful about being human. Our three and a half pound brain. Um, I'll remind you what we've been doing lately is solving equations like this using the uh, square root property. The square root property says, well, x equals plus or minus the square root of 25. That's SRP. And of course, we know we have a good definition. We define this symbol here, radical, for positive numbers. That's the positive number such that when you square it, you get 25. That's the definition of radical. Epicaye, two solutions, degree two equation, fundamental theorem of algebra, Gauss, 1777, blah, blah, blah. All right. Um, so that's that's what we've been doing lately, the old equations. We've got something new today. Uh, that is what would happen if it was a seven. Well, same thing, that's pretty easy. This is new, this is new. What, it, what happens if when you have a negative one? We're looking for a number that when you square it, you get negative one. And actually, that's not that easy to find. Because if you go on and you look, everywhere you look, think about all the numbers that we have at our disposal. This is the real number line. If you try zero, obviously zero is not gonna work because zero times zero is zero, not negative one. If you try any of these numbers, any of these, on the right hand side, these are all positive. A positive number times a positive number would give you a positive number, it wouldn't give you a negative one. So none of these work. Try any of these. A negative number times a negative will give you a positive. So none of these will work. So pretty much I've exhausted, I've proven that, or I outlined the proof of why none of the real numbers would work here. Nothing works. It is quote unquote unsolvable. Well, for monkeys, but not for humans, because we've got a three and a half pound brain with which we do miracles. Here's what we did on this one. On this one, what we said, you know what? There is no solution, so we will invent one. That's it. We will invent one. How audacious is that? Audacity, audacity, and more audacity. We just invented one. So we, uh, we invent one just out of thin air when you invent a number and we shall call it I. And it, it might seem like a crazy idea, but if you think about it, we've been inventing things all our lives for the last 50 billion years. Humans have inventing things all over the place. When we had this one, x squared is equal to seven, and there was no solution, we invented a new symbol, the square root of seven, to represent that number, even though it's pinpointing it was kind of hard because it's such a evasive number. It's long, it's infinite. Um, we've been inventing things all our lives, and so this is not that new but uh, it appears new and so this I number stands for imaginary uh, we imagined it uh, to, is uh, was born to be the square root of negative one and so for the first time we have this symbol applied to negative numbers I is equal to the square root of negative one or said differently I square I was born to be the number that when you square it you get negative one that's the definition of I okay and using that, everything else that we learn about the square root property still works. Everything. Um, and so we could tackle this problem in the following way. X equals plus or minus the square root of negative 1 by square root property. And of course that means X equals plus or minus I by definition of uh, I. Okay? And that's how we handle it. Now this brings up a whole new uh, can of worms, this uh, I thing. And so <clears throat> we should take a moment and try to understand what are, it, what are its properties. The only thing we invented it to do, or the only thing that we define it to do, is that I squared is equal to negative 1. That has deep consequences, and we should just take a moment to analyze those. Once we do that, we'll take a moment to meet and get to know this I number, and then we'll come back and solve a whole bunch of more square root uh, or degree two equations using the square root property even in the cases when you have negative numbers on the right hand side all right that's the game plan so we're taking a little detour to study i and we'll come back to solve equations so we call this section working with i or getting to know how i works uh recall uh this uh, it behaves a lot like polynomials so before if you remember how we uh, solved polynomials it's, it was extremely easy we would do something like this 2x plus 1 uh, well, plus 3x plus 4. If that is your given, you could rearrange the parentheses and commute things. 
so that you put the x's together and the x less things together. This is commutative law of addition and associative law of addition, meaning that you can group them, all the x's together and the things that don't have an x together. 5x plus 5, this is by inspection. This is what we did before for polynomials. That or you stack them and you use the kindergarten method. It turns out that working with i feels a lot the same, a lot the same way. Uh, a lot like this, it is identical. So for i's we would work like this. Uh, we could even stack them as before. 2i's, whoa, that was interesting. 2i plus 1 plus 3i plus 4. We add like terms and we don't add unlike terms. This is by kindergarten method. Same way that we used, the, the same techniques that we used for adding polynomials. That's beautiful. Multiplying i's, no problem. We will do the same thing. Recall how we multiply uh, regular polynomials. We would use the FOIL and this would be 2x squared for the first. This would be 1x for the inner, 10x for the outer, and 5 for the for the uh, last, and that would give you 2x squared plus 11x plus 5 by inspection. Exactly, exactly the same ideas work for i. So this would be 2i squared plus 1i plus uh, 10. That looks like a 10i. To me, plus 5. Uh, this is by FOIL again. And so that would give you a grand total of 2i squared plus 11i plus 5. Same as uh, this one, except this one's got x's. 2x squared plus 11x plus 5. This one's got i's. Other than that, I don't see a difference. Um, get it? I don't see a difference. All right. Um, the, the, however, there is a difference. There's a super, super important difference, and I'm about to point it out right here. This is the moment. So far, they look identical. Look, working with polynomials, working with i's, same thing. The crucial difference, of course, is this incredibly important exchange rate. i squared can always, always be exchanged for a negative one. This is ex an exchange rate. You can think about it as an exchange rate. You can exchange one for the other. So if it's i squared, I can exchange it for a negative one. And so that would give me this much. This is a, by definition of i. This is by inspection. This is a crucial difference right here. This becomes negative two. So I have negative two plus 11i plus five. And now all of a sudden, these were not like terms because that was an i squared. Now they are like terms because the i squared was exchanged for a negative one. Um, so now I can combine them. So I get 11i uh, plus three. That's beautiful right there. Now, uh, this shows the difference between i's. So far, up to this point, it's exactly the same as polynomials. You make your exchange rate, and that's that's how that's the only difference with working in uh, working with i's. Okay. You can also take a look at powers of i. Powers of i behave nicely. I square, of course, we say it was negative one. I to the third. Well, what is i to the third? You can break it up as three or sorry, two i's. Let me undo that. Two i's and an i. That's because that's three i's. And we have again the famous exchange rate. i squared can always be exchanged for a negative one times i. This is by natural exponents. This is by definition of i. And of course, this is by minus theorem. Everything that we learned before still works. Beautiful. i to the third can always, always be exchanged for a negative i. That's, that's beautiful right there. Uh, the next logical thing is, what about i to the fourth, man? What can we do with i to the fourth? Well, i to the fourth, you can break it up in many ways. One way to break it up is i square and i square. That's by uh, just adding the exponents, j, right? And so, uh, but this has an, an amazingly good advantage because we have a famous exchange rate for negative for i square. That can be exchanged for a negative one, and that can be exchanged for a negative one by definition of i. And so, this becomes one by not not. Remember when we first proved not not? Those were good times, huh? Um, this is beautiful. This tells you something crucial, absolutely crucial and timeless. Every i to the fourth can be exchanged for a one. Every i to the fourth can be exchanged for a one. I'm going to say it again. Every i to the fourth can be exchanged for a one. Okay? There's nobody here to stop me, so I'll say it again. i to the fourth can be exchanged for a one. That right there is crucial. Watch how it plays here. I to the fifth. I to the fifth, I can break it up as I to the fourth times I by just adding the exponents. And I break it up this way because I have a beautiful 
statement here about i to the fourth. What did we just say? Like 20 times? That i to the fourth can be exchanged for a one. So I can exchange here for a one. And uh, that would just give you i to the fourth. That's, I'd say pw, previous work, previous page. And that just becomes i, one i. Now this starts to sound familiar now by multiplicative identity. Notice what happened here. We started with five i's, five i's. And by the time we were done, we ended up with one eye, only one. Does that remind you of anything? I know, huh? Brilliant. Woo, mind blowing. Watch this. Suppose you start off with six eyes. I could break this up as four eyes and two eyes. Why? Because two plus four is six. I could also break it up as I to the third and I to the third, but that's not as famous uh, be, be because this one is super famous. This is by Jay, by the way because I have a super famous exchange rate for i to the fourth that becomes one one times i square and so that's by previous work and so now I just get i square uh, by multiplicative identity um, amazing I started off with six six i's and I ended up only with two what does that remind you of okay what does that remind you of um, it should remind you exactly exactly of the fish story the eyes, the powers of I behave exactly, exactly like the fish story. When you start off with six of them, six fish, you would end up with two because every group of four can go. They can go and goodbye. They're gone. Groups of four, not groups of three, not groups of five. Groups of four can go as many as they want. The eyes behave exactly, exactly the same way. Check this out. If I have ten, I'm going to separate into groups of four. Those four will be gone. Those four, because in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, hey, every i to the fourth can be exchanged for one, and that's the multiplicative identity. It does nothing to anybody. It disappears, psh, boom, just like the fish. i to the fourth is a multiplicative identity. That's why I run a group, make groups of four, and whatever's left over, what, let it be, whatever it is. Uh, I don't care what's left over, but I, I care that I can take away groups of four. And so this would, of course, be one times one times i square by the previous work we did, and so that becomes just i square. Uh, which is negative one incidentally, negative one. This is by multiplicative identity and of course that's one by definition of I. So beautiful. The I's, the powers of I behaving just like um, the fish story. There's also another way to look at it. You could look at it as clock arithmetic. This is famous stuff. The fish story is not just a little story, it's huge. Uh, the fancy name for it is called modular arithmetic and it happens everywhere around. Um, for example, days of the week. Every seven days disappear. Like if today's Saturday, seven days from now, again Saturday, back where you started. Uh, eight days from now, the first seven will disappear and it'll be Sunday. Um, you know the hours of the day. Every 24 you start off where you start where you end up where you started. So here's another way to look at it. You could look at it i i i square um, i to the zero zero i's one i two i's and three i's. If you want ten of them, you could just go around. If you can think about this as a clock. So this would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. I told you, 10, i to the 10th. What's, what would i to the 6th be? You just go like this. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. That would be i to the 6th, etc., etc. So the, uh, this is deep. Uh, the um, fish story is deep. Dr. Seuss got nothing on the hands. All right, that's how uh, powers of i work. Um, maybe I try one more. 27. So how many groups of 27 can I get out of? How many groups of four can I get? I can get four, four. So far I've got eight, four. I to the fourth. Ooh, that's 16. I to the fourth. That would be 20, right? And I can get one more 24. And of course I would have three left over. That's just by just adding the exponents. And so uh, obviously I just have I to the third left. Um, I multiplicative identity and the previous work where I can exchange every one of these for the identity gone and of course the previous work said that this was negative i <clears throat> and there it is i to the 27th is the same thing as negative i you can exchange it beautiful stuff um, that gives you a little tiny introduction to complex numbers uh, we shall now come back and uh, pick up where we left off where we're solving equations uh, using the square root property and some of them will involve eyes. Uh, actually before we do let's, let's just uh, do one more thing with eyes that is important. Let's settle once and for all the square root properties uh, for negative numbers. <coughs> 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 <coughs>
So prior to this, <clears throat> we had defined uh, the radicals for positive numbers. If you look, go back and look carefully, we, we said if A is a positive number, we try to figure out, we explain what the square root is. It's a positive real solution to, this, to the equation, x squared equals A, blah, blah, blah. But <clears throat> we had never done any square roots of negatives, such as this, square root of negative. We, we never defined such a beast. We now have the tools to do it properly. And it's going to go like this. If that piece is positive and you got a negative, so this is legitimately negative, um, the definition will be that you take this negativeness out and it becomes i times the square root of 25. That's by definition of negative radical. That, that's what we do right there. That's what this definition is. And it's consistent with the quotient of the product, this product of the quotients and the uh, radical of the product is the product of the radicals. It's consistent with that. Uh, here's an alternative way to see why it's consistent with that theorem. You could take the square root of negative 25 and say, well, that's the square root of negative 1 times 25. And the radical of the product is equal to the product of the radicals. In other words, the splitting up into little baby radicals was valid if one of them was positive. In this case, one of them is positive. So this checks. So that's the... Um, radical of the product is product of the radicals rule and so this becomes i of course by definition this becomes five definition of i and definition of radical and so there we go we simplified it something that we hadn't done before these negative radicals now we can do it because we have excellent tools we have the i the imaginary number okay how about this one well of course again you could take out the uh, negativeness uh, whoa you could take out the negativeness and you can say uh, let me undo that. It's i times square root of 16. That's by definition of negative radicals. And so this becomes um, i times 4, definition of the radical rad re regular radical. That's how you handle that one. How about this one? You can break up this one like this. Negative 1 times 4 times 3. Why not? This is just by the times table and minus theorem. And I, here's another way to look at it. Negative square root of negative 1, square root of 4, square root of 3 that's because the radical of the product is equal to the product of the radicals and so this becomes i times 2 times square root of 3 by definition of i and definition of radicals and there you go, you've simplified it, 2i square root of 3 okay alright, appears that the pizza's here see you guys, good luck, I'm <laughs> not just kidding